Hi, my name is Sam Wheeler, and today I'm going to be talking to you about cryptographic hash functions and the SHA-1 algorithm in particular. So what are hash functions? It's a function that's used to map data of an arbitrary size to return data of a fixed size. So that sounds a little bit abstract. So we've seen them used in hash tables to map text to numeric table indices. So we saw that we could take the ASCII character codes, sum them, and then use a modulo to basically say that no matter how big the string you input, you will always only receive a value that's within your, the length of your array. So that's what it means. We have any arbitrary sized input, whether that's number, text, whatever, but the output will be a, you know, a fixed size output. And they also have widespread uses in cryptography, which we're going to go into. So what are cryptographic hash functions? So they've been described as the workhorses of modern cryptography. So a few features about them. They are deterministic. That means any input, you will always receive the same output, no matter what. They are fast. They rely a lot on uh, bitwise operations, which we've seen can be easily computed quickly. And the computers are going to be need to sometimes running these hash functions thousands of times over. So they need to be constructed in a way that the computer can run them very, very quickly and efficiently. They're irreversible. So when you hear the word cryptography, oftentimes you think of encrypting and decrypting things. But in a cryptographic hash function, when you put your value in and receive your hash digest out of the function, you never reverse that process. It's not an encryption and decryption. You simply encrypt it, and it can never be decrypted. So it sounds a little abstract, but if you think of a mathematical operation like addition, if I gave you the number 100 and said to reverse that operation, I'd added two numbers together, you have no idea. You just have to guess and hope that you can guess what numbers I put together. So that's kind of what irreversible means in this programmatic terms. Uh, and they utilize the avalanche effect. So due to this kind of looping, cascading nature of the functions that we're going to go into, if you put in two incredibly similar inputs. Like I, I, so when we go through SHA-1, I tested SHA-1 by putting this like 600 word quote in. And then I put one letter to lowercase and put the same quote in. And the output is completely different, even though you know, it's 99% the same with this huge input string. The output will always be vastly different, even though the inputs only change a little bit. And they're collision resistant. So this means that you're, the odds of finding two hash inputs that result in the same hash digest output is basically probabilistically impossible uh, if it's a good hash function. It's just so incredibly small chance that, that would ever happen that it can be considered pretty much impossible, with, especially with modern computing technology. So just some key takeaways first about cryptographic hash functions. There's pre-image resistance. This is a cryptographic term. And this means that if you have an output hash digest, there is no way to know the input value that resulted in that digest. Even if you have the exact hash algorithm line for line, you can't know without guessing. Second pre-image resistance means that if I give you an input and the hash function and the hash digest output, there is also no way to find another input that will result in the same digest output without guessing, again, which is probabilistically impossible. So seeing these features and this collision resistance, you can see the security of these cryptographic hash functions, because they're unbreakable without using a complete brute force approach. The only way to break them is to guess like something on the order of 2 to the 80 times over and over again, spitting in every possible combination and hope that maybe you strike gold. Uh, and they're one way. They're never decrypted. When you put something into a cryptographic hash function, you get the result, and you never reverse that operation. So this is just a quick uh, diagram showing what SHA-1 does. You can see that the digest output will always be the same 40 character hexadecimal value, which is just a base 16 number. No matter the input length of the string, it's always a 40 character output. And even in, I don't know if you can really read that text, but those are sentences that just have one letter change in them, and the outputs are pretty much completely different. So just illustrating some of these features that I talked about. So practical uses. Before we get into how these things work, where are they used today if they're truly these workhorses of modern cryptography? So for one, all across the internet, they're used in verifying file and message integrity. So if you think of sending someone an email, and you want to make sure that, that email hasn't been corrupted or lost some sort of data in transit, or you know, somebody else like hacked you and whatever wrote some other funny email that they sent instead, uh, I don't know when that would happen, but maybe. So basically, you can hash the text content of your email before you send it. And then you get that resulting hash digest. And you send that along with your email. And then when the 
know, the other client gets the email, they can also hash it through the same algorithm and say, hey, now I have these two hash digests. Are they the same? And if they are, you're good to go. It hasn't been corrupted. Nothing has changed. And if they're not, then you know there's a problem. And it's a really easy and efficient way to do that. And this is used not just in emails, but in all sorts of like file transfers and pretty much like all sorts of communication all over the internet today. It's also used in file and data identification, which is kind of a similar offshoot of what I was just talking about. And it is used by Git. So Git can actually track whether you have changes in files that need to be committed because it can hash the text content of your file. And even if you, know, you have 10,000 lines of code in one file and you just change one variable name, the resulting digest output will be a completely different one. So it knows, hey, I have to, change, I have to stage this file to be committed again. And Git internally actually stores your files as these objects, and their name will be their SHA-1 digest value. So if you go in and pick around in Git, which we did in one of our CS Saturdays, you can see that the names of these files are actually just these hexadecimal codes that are SHA-1. Uh, and password verification. So we've also seen this a little bit uh, in Grace Shopper, that if you are inputting a password into a website, and they're you know, using some sort of modern security system, actually, in their database, they don't just store your password. They store the hash value of your password. So even if I broke into the database and had a list of all the hash values, and I know which hash algorithm you're using, I still have no way to guess. I can't, like, that, that information is useless to me. Um, so this makes things a lot more secure. And there's a lot that goes into password verification beyond just hash algorithms. Like, sometimes it'll run them, like, 2,000 times or things like that. But we're, we're not going to get into that today. So how do they work? Uh, they kind of seem like this mysterious black box. Uh, it has the word cryptographic, which uh, is kind of a daunting uh, and intimidating word. And so when I first started researching them, I decided, you know, I'm going to build SHA-1 in JavaScript and see if I can do this. And I came across this diagram, and it made no sense to me. And it still makes no sense to me. I don't really know what this is trying to say. I, some of this is like bitwise operations, but I'm going to go through it in a way that makes way more sense than this, because this makes it look much more complicated than it needs to be. And you're going to see that these things are actually pretty easy when you get down to it. So SHA-1, just a quick overview. It was designed and published by the NSA in the mid-'90s. Uh, it was commonly used all over the internet as kind of this underpinning of internet security uh, through the mid-2000s, late 2000s, mid-2000s. And it's no longer considered secure. So they showed that, theoretically, it could be broken several orders of magnitude uh, easier than they thought it would be just by this brute force approach. And no one has actually broken it yet, but just showing that maybe it could be broken with supercomputers in a shorter time than we thought is enough to say, like, we cannot use this algorithm anymore. So actually this year, like, all the major browsers are going to start, I think they're just going to flag any websites that they see that are using this for security. And I, I think that's why you get, like, those Chrome messages that it's insecure and stuff like that. Uh, and it takes in any input text and spits out a 40-digit hexadecimal value. So how SHA-1 works. So it basically is all just string and array manipulation and bitwise operators. So it, it's kind of verbose. We're going to walk through it here. But like starting this process research, researching these, I thought they were so intimidating, kind of just these weird, like intimidating black boxes. But it's really, really simple step by step. So that's kind of my point of walking you through this, is that like any of us can, can build this. And it's really easy to build in JavaScript. Uh, and it's actually not that scary when you get down to it. And the whole SHA family, because there's a SHA 2, 3, I think 5, uh, and a bunch of them, they're actually all really similar to SHA 1. So if you can build one, you can build the rest of them as well. So first, we're going to take our input text, split it into an array of all these characters, and then s turn those characters into their ASCII codes, uh, something we've all done before. So then we're going to convert these ASCII codes into binary and then just pad zeros at the front of each of these until they're 8 bits long. And you, I have all these sort of utilities functions uh, in my code here that I tried to name in a sort of logical way so you can tell what's going on. Then you join them together and append a 1. Then you pad the binary message with zeros until its length is 512 mod 448. So this is actually really important because these hash, va these hash functions will always output uh, the same, like this 40 digit value. So no matter if you put in like the entire text of the Bible or one letter, it will always output a value that is 40 characters in length. So you need to basically make sure it's divisible. We're doing this padding to make sure that we can take this input and make it divisible by 512 
just so that we can kind of chunk it down and like split it up in this uniform way, no matter how big the input is. So it's just a simple while loop, and you end up with these crazy convoluted long binary numbers that I'm not going to read out just by all their ones and zeros. Uh, so then you take, go back to step three, take our 8-bit ASCII code array, take its length, and convert that to binary. Pad that with zeros at the front until it's 64 characters. And then we just stick that on this long binary message from step five. So if you wanted to count all those numbers, you would see that this is 512 characters in length. And if we had a longer input, we're just doing uh, a test, which is a short input. But basically, we would just have multiple chunks of these 512 character things. Because no matter how big your input, this will be a string of a length that's divisible equally by 512. And that's really important. So then you break this message into an array of chunks of 512 characters. For us, that's just one. Uh, and then you can break each chunk into a subarray of 16 32-bit words. Again, really simple. So this is where it gets a little more complex. Not going to walk through it line by line. But you basically loop through each chunk array of 16 32-bit words and extend it to 80 using bitwise operations. So just every word here, performing a bunch of XORs, and then pushing onto the array with that created new word until they're 80. It looks like that. Now we're going to initialize some constants. And it's now, this is kind of the meat of the function. And basically, you just loop through all these chunks we've created and use bitwise operations and variable reassignment on these constants from the previous function to basically continually reassign these five variables with different values that are the result of bitwise operations. So this is why it's always a uniform length output. Because no matter how long your input, you're only manipulating these five variables. It's just how much are you manipulating them. Then you can convert each of those variables to hexadecimal. Easy. Join them together and return it. You have your hash value. Easy. So we can do really quickly. We can hash. This was a great presentation, Sam. Boom. That's our hash value. This is a JavaScript function. And yeah, so key takeaways. Cryptographic hash functions, they're one way and unbreakable except by a brute force approach. They're everywhere. And they're not so scary once you get into the details of them. Uh, thank you. And here's some additional resources in my GitHub repo if you want to check it out.